I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. My next guest is the daughter of a well-known British diplomat who stood up for the Palestinian rights 80 years ago. Vanessa Bealy, journalist, photographer, and controversial narrator of media manipulations in Syria, is an activist, artist in her own right, and we hope you enjoy this show. Vanessa Bealy, daughter of Sir Harold Bealy, Middle Eastern advisor to Ernest Bevin and special envoy to Cairo during both Suez crises. In 2012, she made several trips to Gaza, the first being in August 2012, when entry was not permitted after the murder of Egyptian soldiers during Ramadan. She finally made it into Gaza via the tunnel system in November 2012 just prior to the Israeli aggression, Operation Pillar of Defense. She left Gaza in December 2012 and spent extended time in Egypt, where she witnessed the 2012 referendum designed to increase Muslim Brotherhood leader Mohamed Morsi's powers in Egypt. She returned to Egypt in 2013 and was witness to many of the anti-Morsi demonstrations where her friends were targeted by security forces and imprisoned during protests. After several trips to Gaza, she launched the Facebook page The Wall Will Fall to publish her photographs and articles on life in the Gaza Strip. The idea behind the page and The Wall Will Fall was to raise awareness, but also to convey the idea that through education, awareness and the development of our own consciousness, we can bring down all walls that keep us in ignorance and far from the truth. In August 2016, when she re-entered Syria after several travels to this country as an independent writer and photographer, she visited many areas, including Aleppo. Her primary reason for being in Syria was to complement her research into the multi-million NATO and Persian Gulf Arab state-funded terrorist-linked white helmets created in 2013 by a British ex-military and intelligence officer, James LaMazuria. As part of this research, she met with the Real Syria Civil Defense, established in 1953, and a member of the International Civil Defense Organization, and recorded their testimony against the White Helmets. Thus, one of her most important investigations has been into the NATO member state financed, non-NGO operating in Syria, the White Helmets. She has several works on this issue, and she says that White Helmets is a shadow state, propaganda construct, that has worked to criminalize the Syrian government and Syrian Arab army on behalf of their bankrollers in the West and Persian Gulf Arab states. Hello. Hello, good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good, good, good to good. meet you, yes, albeit yes. on Skype. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great, great. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate I appreciate the chance. Uh, let me begin with um, when was the as you as you as a journalist when was the awakening call when you start working and writing and discovering that there's something that you have to do that the general public is not aware. Where where was that spark sparking moment? Um. <clears throat> Uh, actually, this is a question that is asked um, relatively often, and my response would be, um, I think those questions were sparked in my mind by my father, um, who was British ambassador during the Suez crisis in Egypt and was then called back as a special envoy um, by President Gamal Abdul Nasser in 67. Um, 
and who supported and fought for Palestinian rights for the majority of his career, along with a, a small cartel of other MPs who were also against the um, occupation of Palestine post Second World War. Um, so I think while I was not actively um, campaigning um, for the rights and the just causes, or I believe them to be just causes that I'm, I have been doing in the last um, seven years, I would say that that sort of germ of activism and, and journalism to expose the truth um, was probably instilled in me by my father, who, who maintained his principles and his integrity, even when it brought him into conflict with his own government. So I, I would say if that's a difficult one to answer. I would say from 2012 onwards, I was very actively involved um, in the work that I do. I then went to uh, Gaza for the first time. Um, I entered via the tunnels um, via the Egyptian border. And two days afterwards was when Israel started bombing in 2012. So I think from there, it, it sort of, it, it, Steamrolled from there. Uh, do you also know Arabic? No, I'm very ashamed to say I don't. <laughs> I'm trying. No. I am trying. And, and the plan is to concentrate a little more on it in the next year. <laughs> okay. You're also a photographer. Yes. So yeah. I, I would like to enhance this report with some of your photographs, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the experiences that one of my colleagues was just mentioning was your presence in the tunnels. Talk about that. How did it affect you? Uh, and that's, that was like a first report from the tunnels that came out before the war started. Can you just before we get to Syria, I'd like to talk about uh, mm. Gaza. Yeah. OK, um, well, I think um, for me, I think that was quite a defining moment, because I think at some point as a human being, you recognize that the limits we put upon ourselves are self-imposed limits and that if you are going to um, break through unjust systems and challenge unjust um, laws that are imposed upon weaker states by the more powerful states, then we have to start considering the breaking of the breaking through of those limits. And so for me, that's what the tunnel experience was. I mean, it, it's nothing special to Palestinians who use the, the network of thousands of tunnels to receive um, daily supplies, to receive vehicles, to receive all manner of things that, of course, they are prevented from receiving by um, the, uh, the the blockade by Israel, the illegal and, and heinous blockade by Israel. So that that's how I would describe it. I do have a fear of enclosed spaces, yeah. so it was actually quite a difficult decision for me, although actually, in the end, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Photo photographically, what kind of a challenge was yeah. that? The tunnels? Yes. Light. Light. Um, you know, there was there was very little light from memory. There were a couple of light bulbs um, on the way through. Um, filming was a little bit difficult, but we did. I did have a colleague that had a light um, shining behind me. Uh -huh. But it, it was, you know, it, it was um, these kind of experiences um, bring us back down to earth, I think. They, they show us what peoples around the world are having to endure in order to survive yeah. um, when battling against the effects of imperialism. Yeah, just, just one more follow-up question on Gaza. Mm -hmm. How do you feel after 2012 when uh, today uh, the people of Gaza can reply the atrocities with their missiles and can reach a ceasefire so quickly? Um. I think I feel, um, you know, the, the the question of disproportionate force has always been the question that is applied to the conflict between um, Palestine and its illegal occupying force um, of the Zionist state. Um, so anything, in my opinion, you know, under international law, Palestine has the right to resist and it has the right to defend its territory, it has the right to defend its people against disproportionate force. Um, are we seeing a big shift? I'm not entirely convinced. What we are maybe seeing 
um, is a lack of willingness on, on Israel's part at this stage with the ratcheting up of tension between the US and Iran and Hezbollah to, to further inflame the situation at this delicate point. It could be more to do with that. I haven't, I haven't processed that whole um, right. thing yet. Right. And you go back to Gaza? Do you have the will to go back? I went back in 2013 and actually that's when I started um, to pick up interest in what was happening in Syria because uh, I think it was in April 2013 that the Israeli um, entity bombed Damascus with a suspected at the time form of neutron bomb. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed a member of Hamas at the time who, uh, let's say, excused the aggression by saying that Damascus has crossed Israel's red line by supplying weapons to Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I, I think I realized that the whole sort of the threads of the resistance were unraveling and that Syria was the pivotal point around which that was taking place. And so that's where I started to become um, a lot more interested in, in what was actually going on and who was behind uh, the conflict in Syria. Yeah, Syria is, is a dramatic center. Um, yeah. you, you as a journalist and a photographer, um, so let's begin with the subject of Syria. Mm. What did Syria do to you as a <laughs> journalist? And, your, and I know what you've done about the white helmets and going against, <laughs> absolutely going against the grain uh, of uh, talking about the white helmets. I mean, what you're saying is uh, it's hypocrisy. And that takes mm. a, a, a certain measure of guts to say it. Talk about that drama and why and what you have done in Syria. Oh, <laughs> where to start with Syria? I mean, I think Syria for me um, was an eye opener as to the extent to which, particularly my government's intelligence and deep state, if you like, was involved in the destabilization of this country. Um, and of course, this goes back to, to pre-2011, it goes back to the Bush Blair communiques during um, the war against Iraq in 2003, when of course they were already discussing the future destabilization of Syria if it didn't come into line um, with their policies in the region. And of course, that's effectively, you know, in, in a nutshell, what we're seeing. So I think for me, the White Helmets was something that I could do something about. I think that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. Um, when I identified um, the propaganda construct or the intelligence construct as I perceived it, and then I started to, to go deeper and deeper into its connections, of course, with the terrorist groups, with um, the blueprint that began back in former Yugoslavia in Kosovo in 1999, created by exactly the same um, former MI6 operative that then went on to create the White Helmets in Syria, I started to see that this was, if you like, um, not only, I, I believe, one of the most important intelligence assets working against Syria, inside Syria, but created by the external forces, yes. but also symbolic of what our countries in the West do um, when they are trying to, to as I say, tenderize a target nation right. or destabilize them prior to some form of humanitarian intervention or military intervention or of course economic intervention. I'm going to use some of your quotes which I think are very interesting could be the the quotes could be my questions. In what mm -hmm. point, one point you say white helmet construct has an entire industry of public relation in agencies, government linked influencers and mm -hmm. billionaire networks protecting their questionable reputation. Elaborate on that. <laughs> well, basically, I mean, when you look at the White Helmet organization, this has always slightly puzzled me. I mean, we've seen these type of constructs in the past, even if we look at uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army, because I make a very clear parallel between this entity and the White Helmets. Um, if we look at that, it, it's sort of, okay, it was transformed into the Kosovo Security Corps, by James Le Missouri, who then, as I say, went on to create the White Helmets in Syria. But it kind of, to some extent, disappeared off our radar. In other words, you know, the, the, the dirty secrets were brushed under the carpet and we moved on. What is strange for me um, and unfamiliar with the White Helmets is that we have 
effectively an intelligence construct that has been exposed time and time and time again. It is accused by the Syrian civilians of being involved in organ trafficking, in child abduction, in execution, both of prisoners of war and of civilians, of um, imprisonment, of torture, detainment, etc. Everything that is in collaboration with the terrorist groups occupying specific areas. But there has literally been this circling of wagons, this ring fencing around this organization mm -hmm. by every single possible layer of empires, um, matrix, let's say, you know, from, from the think tanks, from the NATO alliance institutions, from Hollywood, um, from an entire billionaire complex. I mean, we have actually gone into this in, in some depth. <laughs> the number of billionaires that are involved either directly or indirectly in the funding of the, the, the entire PR industrial complex for the White Helmets. What? And now we're seeing them being used almost as a social engineering instrument. Um, children are being given books, um, early learning books featuring the White Helmets. There's the new Call of Duty video game, <laughs> which further iconizes the White Helmets. So for me, this is quite an extraordinary phenomenon. I think it's pretty unprecedented. And my only reasoning can be that the the plan for this organization is to be used as a global franchise, even if it's not still called the White Helmets. We've seen them appear um, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, um, in Venezuela, potentially. We haven't made a direct connection, but they are certainly being seen during you know the the externally fermented insurgents against the venezuelan government so for me i think this is what is important they are protecting the concept for future use that's that's the only kind of yes, okay. reasoning i can come up with yeah uh, let me go to something a specific quote you you said recently in september 2018 a family mm. from idlib informed me that the white helmets had played a role in the abduction of their 11-year-old son, Ahmad, to be used in the staging of a chemical attack, an attack, quote, quote, that would permit further unlawful aggression from the UK, US, French alliance in defense of their proxy forces now gathered in Idlib. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. This was um, an interview that I did um, with a family who, as they explained, their son had actually been taken from Aleppo, from memory and had been taken to Idlib with a number of other children. Now, through relatives in Idlib, they had managed to actually to, to follow or to track um, where these children were being taken. And when they put that um, with the reports of potential fake chemical attacks by the terrorist groups, they could see that their children were being moved from one place to another in preparation. Um, for one of these hoax attacks. And of course, you know, people may say, well, how can you possibly say that they are hoax attacks? The, the Syrian government has used chemical weapons before, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, the alleged Duma chemical attack in March 2018 and the subsequent OPCW report and the subsequent um, uh, report that OPCW didn't include, which was from um, engineers which were instructed by the OPCW, who produced a report that effectively confirmed that this was a fake attack, but not only that, that potentially civilians, and this is my belief, civilians were murdered in order to produce the effects mm -hmm. of that attack. And mm -hmm. um, now that um, testimony of child abduction is not isolated. Um, when I've spoken with civilians in liberated areas for example, Eastern Ghouta, Dada, um, East Aleppo, they have all told me very similar. I mean, I spoke to one woman in Eastern Ghouta who told me that she lived in fear and other mothers lived in fear of their children being abducted, particularly by the White Helmets, but also by the terrorist groups who worked in tandem with um, the White Helmets. So the two were interchangeable, basically, according, again, to civilian testimony, but also according to much of the video evidence that the White Helmets themselves produce, of themselves celebrating um, with various armed groups inside Syria, 
of them participating in or cleaning up after extrajudicial executions of civilians and prisoners of war. So, you know, the evidence is not only coming from one mm -hmm. area, and it's mm -hmm. certainly not coming only from myself or from Russia, as of course is proposed by Western media. Um, it's coming from predominantly Syrian civilians, but it's being backed up by the White Helmet production um, failures, let's say, um, when they're actually promoting their allegiance to um, the extremist armed groups inside Syria. Uh, do you get a chance to go to universities or groups that invite you to talk about these elaborated in a more casual way besides your articles? <laughs> what, in the West? Yes. No. <laughs> no, no. no, no. I, I mean, you know, the, the sort of, I think the hijacking of, um, I, I think what has been highlighted for me um, in, the, in the years that I've been working against, push back against, Western media state-aligned propaganda that has worked to manufacture consent for humanitarian, and I always say humanitarian in inverted commas, and military intervention in Syria, um, is the taking hostage of or the hijacking of, for example, academic institutions, um, particularly in the UK. But for example, um, I was invited to speak at a well-known university with connections, let's say, to NATO in Sweden. And I was roundly attacked by a number of Latvian um, and Estonian, not so much Latvian, actually, more of the Estonian um, students, but also afterwards by the media, who hounded me for about two weeks. After that, rather than, and, and you know, when I spoke at the Geneva Press Club, for example, um, it was boycotted by, believe it or not, Reporters Without Borders who decided that freedom of speech didn't apply to my evidence against the White Helmets. Wow, okay. So, no, I mean, there's been an extraordinary campaign of, of censorship and um, censorship by exclusion and by silence. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking that because uh, in, in Iran, there's a tradition we have <laughs> where we do invite uh, journalists mm. from the West, thinkers, writers, or those, um, those whistleblowers, basically. And yeah. they're, they're hugely popular. Uh, university hopping from one center to another, from one mm. province to another, and they're they're like received as a rock star reception. And I was, <laughs> and one of them was just asking me this morning, if uh, if I come up with some new candidates, would they accept to come to speak at our universities? Would you be interested yeah. in that? Yeah, I would love to. Be an honor. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, can I, I? I'd like to conclude about what are you doing now? What, what are you focusing on now? <clears throat> um, now, uh, um, I mean, basically, you know, the, it, I, the white helmet has become almost an obsession for me. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we, we are making a big breakthrough in public consensus. And um, I think if I looked at the Syrian narrative three years ago, it felt very much like we were chasing um, the Western narrative and trying to, if you like, counter it. Now I would say the tables have turned and I would say actually that a lot of the time the Western media is chasing our narratives mm -hmm. and trying to discredit it and trying to discredit the messenger. So for me, that's already a massive improvement in public consensus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same can be said for the White Helmets. I would say now that the majority of public consensus is, if not entirely against them, at least doubts have been raised, questions have been raised. And of course, what I always argue is that there should be a public inquiry into this organization. It's publicly funded um, by particularly British funds that have siphoned through the Conflict Stability and Security Fund to the White Helmets and other organizations aiding and abetting the terrorists in Syria. So if nothing else, with the number of reports and the amount of evidence against this group, there should be a call for a public inquiry against them. You know, we've had them against Oxfam, we've had them against the Red Cross. There is no reason that the White Helmets should be exempt from this. So I think that is part of my major campaign now is to push um, for some kind of political diplomatic recognition of the crimes of this group and to demand publicly, um, through public pressure, a public an inquiry into them. Now, whether there is a legal entity that would be brave enough to pick that up and run with it, I don't know at the moment. Yes. Nobody's come forward. Yeah. Um, so my my view going forward is to spend more time in Syria to document, continue documenting um, the crimes committed 
by the US coalition um, and its allies in the region against the Syrian people that you know that is my priority um, I'm not so much a political animal I'm very much uh, for uh, um, raising the voices of the unheard the disappeared by Western media and Western governments mm -hmm. and that for me going forward is a priority you know you're living in France and, and every Saturday mm. you witness the, the yellow vests. Yeah. Um, do you think France is in the threshold of something that with this continuing uh, objection? Yeah. Um, a lot of people have spoken to me um, about the fact that potentially this, this entire movement has been co-opted, that it is being engineered and manufactured, you know, that it's just another color revolution. But I think... Um, the evidence against that is the fact that the media is so, so vehemently and almost universally against the Gilets Jaunes movement. They've tried to criminalize them. We've seen recently Macron making statements that even anti-Zionist statements are now going to be considered as anti-Semitic, that the Gilets Jaunes are very much based in either alt-right, um, far left or, or anti-Semitic. Um, camps, which is entirely untrue. I mean, I've participated in a couple of the marches and, and what I've seen is a tremendous diversity um, across age, across class, across uh, cultures. I mean, uh, they've been extraordinary experiences for me and actually very um, optimistic experiences for me because I believe and I actually always said that if a revolution were to take place in Europe, it would begin in France because the French have a history of revolution, but they also have um, a very strong, um, very strong roots in socialism. Mm -hmm. So therefore, for them, you know, the, the ultimate crime against France, if you like, is the conversion into some sort of totalitarian state or, or, the, or the protection of a plutocracy, which of course is what we're seeing um, Macron doing right now. And that's what he was elected for. He was, ele I mean, he was known as the Mozart of finance within the Rothschild Bank. Mm -hmm. um, he worked his way up through the elite circles in France. And he's there now to protect the ruling classes and to protect globalism, to protect military interventionism to protect the military industrial complex, to protect the, the, the Zionist lobby. You know, all of these entities that are effectively destroying Europe, destroying France, he's there to protect them. And so I think this movement, while it is uh, to some extent lacking in strategy, I think it's a very important movement. I think so far it's been a very intelligent movement in the sense that it has not appointed what I call... Um, identity politics leaders it has kept itself a very horizontal structure when you hear the spokespeople speaking um they are not born speakers they are not natural communicators but they are managing to put across a very clear agenda and i think the most important part of that agenda is the civilian instigated referendum which of course um strikes at the power base of the ruling monopoly. I mean, you know, this threatens to bring it down completely. And of course, that is why, in, in my opinion, that is one of the measures looked for or, or being sought um, by the Gilets Jaunes that is causing the most consternation. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, it's interesting that you, you're British, but you're in, uh, you're in France right now. And also, yeah. it's, it's interesting, your father's influence on you back in his days and um, what he thought about the Palestinian rights and what mm -hmm. you've been pursuing, updating it. And also, I'm imagining you speaking at uh, Iranian universities to the provinces about the white helmets. Uh, yeah. That will be very interesting, uh, the, your first-hand story, narration about what is really mm. going on. Yeah, I would love to. I would really love to. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and uh, wish to see you in person. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Okay. It was a real take, pleasure. Yes, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you for your attention. Hope you've enjoyed the show.